The Bible authors wrote as if God has emotions, and most Christians through history have spoken and behaved as if this were true. But to understand what that means, you have to understand what emotions are, and that requires a small excursion into the history of psychology and the budding field of brain science. So for the next 15 minutes, I'm going to take that detour, and while I do, I'd like you to think about what relevance this has to the Christian concept of a God who is all-loving and all-powerful and all-knowing. After a dark age of authority and dogma and religious fervor, the Enlightenment made rationality supreme. Reason, coupled with empiricism, demonstrably led to advances in knowledge and technology that had been impossible when critical inquiry was suppressed or discouraged. In this context, scholars convinced themselves that emotions were a liability. By the 20th century, schools of cognitive and behavioral psychology argued that we could understand and heal human beings without paying any attention whatsoever to the affective or emotional dimensions of life. Ironically, this hyper-rationality probably was driven in part by a gut-level distaste for the untamed, quote, female quality of emotions. In other words, it was driven by an unacknowledged emotion, a sublimated, sexist version of big boys don't cry. We now know it to be based on a falsehood. Cognition without emotion doesn't get us very far. Damage to emotion centers in the brain can mean that even intelligent people can't learn from their mistakes, and they make harmful social and financial decisions. In his book, Descartes' Air, neurologist Antonio Damasio describes one patient with damage to emotional centers in his brain who can gather and analyze information almost endlessly without it leading to a preference. For a decision to be made, all of that reason and information needs to create a valence, a positive feeling that privileges one option over others and then directs action. As psychologist Marlene Winnell has put it, imagine going into a Baskin Robbins and having to choose one of the 31 flavors of ice cream by rational analysis. In actual fact, this is one of the primary functions of emotion. When we are presented with choices, it guides us towards one among many options. The basic point I am making is that, in humans, emotions are neither a liability nor some superfluous fluff like the wings on an angel. They are practical mental processes that serve a purpose. And since the God of the Bible is described as having emotions, this raises some interesting questions. What exactly are emotions? What are they for? How do they work? And how do these details relate to our notions about God? Let's start with a definition. Emotions are evolved, functional feedback processes that serve the well-being of sentient mobile animals, and social animals in particular. That's a mouthful, so let me break it down. Evolved means emotions have been subject to selective pressures on our ancestors and therefore can be assumed to increase reproductive success. Functional means emotions have a practical purpose or several in the service of surviving and thriving. Feedback processes means emotions are a means of representing information about what goes on internally and externally. Sentient and mobile means emotions have practical value only for creatures that are aware and able to change or move in response to external conditions. Social means emotions are particularly useful for communal species. Furthermore, emotions have a physical component, a psychological component, and a behavioral component. Anger, for example, triggers the release of catecholamines like adrenaline. Heart rate accelerates, and blood is directed away from digestion and toward the limbs in preparation for action. Muscles get tense. The object of anger becomes a consuming focus and may well end up on the receiving end of aggressive action. Different physical, psychological, and behavioral components together make up each emotion, and in fact, researchers use them to measure and categorize emotional reactions. So for God to have an emotion, one would expect that there should be physical, psychological, and behavioral components. 
file that away. Since Charles Darwin's seminal work, The Expression of Emotions in Man and Animals, written back in 1872, many scholars have proposed that there is a set of primary or most basic emotions. The most simple list of primary emotions includes disgust, happiness, sadness, anger, fear, and surprise. These are considered primary because they are found across human cultures and so appear to be universals. They have distinct and universal facial expressions, gestures, and postures. They develop early in life. They can be found in other animal species. They have unique patterns of brain activity. It is thought that other emotions, called secondary and tertiary emotions, are made up of combinations of these. Secondary and tertiary emotions typically require more thinking and appraisal of a situation before they get triggered. They may be shaped by culture and religion, but the building blocks are hardwired. What are emotions for? Emotions function as a motivational system. In a very real sense, all emotions can be thought of as forms of pleasure and pain. They are all either appealing or aversive. Again, think about how this relates to the concept of God. We are motivated to seek emotions or avoid them. As Jeremy Bentham said in his Introduction to the Principles of Morals, published back in 1789, Nature has placed mankind under the governance of two sovereign masters, pain and pleasure. It is for them alone to point out what we ought to do as well as to determine what we do. They govern us in all we do, in all we say, in all we think. In this, we are like other sentient beings. All creatures that experience pleasure and pain are motivated to seek the former and avoid the latter. One of life's little ironies is that religious people often accuse non-religious people of being hedonistic. Then they talk about the benefits of faith, such as love, joy, and peace, when they are not talking about the material benefits of answered prayer, or cities of gold, or dark-eyed virgins. Believers and non-believers alike will point out the hypocrisy of prosperity gospel or martyrdom for virgins, but what they often don't realize is that the more spiritual benefits of religion are equally hedonistic. We all, from the basest pedophile to the most self-negating monk, are about seeking pleasure and avoiding pain. The only real arguments are over what gets us there, what kinds of pleasures are preferable, and whose feelings matter. Affective scientists say that emotion is key in three kinds of processes that help animals, including humans, to survive and thrive. 1. Adaptation Adaptation means being able to respond appropriately to changes in the environment around you. If a saber-toothed tiger shows up at the entrance to your cave, the emotion of fear directs all your focus and energy toward the threat. It prepares your body for a fight. If a husband starts flirting with his neighbor, jealousy may motivate his wife to monitor or block their contact. If a Norwegian farmer feels the first flakes of snow on his face, he may feel a surge of anxiety that makes him hurry to chop more wood or get the animals securely sheltered. 2. Social signaling Ethologists, meaning specialists in animal behavior, as well as social psychologists, say that in communal species, like humans, a second core function of emotions is social coordination. We know this because emotions correlate with very overt, consistent, and, to members of our own species, readable body postures and facial expressions that don't appear to serve any purpose other than communication. In a wolf, bared fangs may communicate irritation or may establish dominance. Bowing or tail wagging may signal submission. An animal that can't read these social-emotional signals is likely to do poorly from a reproductive standpoint. Among humans, our very elaborate control over food production, shelter, health, and so forth requires an equally elaborate social dance. Without emotional signaling, it would be impossible for us to have achieved our current level of technological and economic complexity and population density. 
A child's distress engages us to provide food or tend an injury or seek a distant parent. A friend's hope motivates us to frequent her new business. 3. Self-regulation Self-regulation is the maintenance of your own homeostasis and health. Some scholars use the term homeostatic emotions to describe states like fatigue and hunger that provide feedback on the internal condition of our bodies, but the need to maintain equilibrium is broader than that. Feeling wretched outside in the Seattle rain motivates my chickens to huddle in a window well to preserve body heat. Dissatisfaction with his job got a friend to make changes and start planning an exit strategy. A sense of emotional suffocation moved another friend to leave her relationship. Our basic emotional system evolved long before the higher order reasoning processes and the two function very differently. Emotional processing is faster and more diffuse than rational processing. It activates many body systems, muscles, breathing, thoughts, blood flow, digestion, and more simultaneously. It creates an orchestrated whole body response and conscious feelings are just one part of the mix. Reasoning is more systematic. It allows us to incorporate information that emotions would simply miss. Numeric data, for example. Also, reasoning is more flexible than affect. It allows us to adjust to new experiences and situations. Remember, our instincts and emotions were shaped by our ancestral environment and early history. When the present situation doesn't match these, intuition and emotion can lead us astray. So reasoning becomes particularly important as a corrective mechanism, a backup system for checking and averting mistakes. But even though our emotions may pit themselves against our own interests at times, that doesn't mean emotions should be taken out of the equation. Emotions and reasons complement each other. Too little emotion leads to paralysis. Too much floods us, and the emotion itself drives behavior. Moderate levels of emotion play an advisory role and help us to distill information down into a decision. The field of affective neuroscience has grown and changed so rapidly that for an outsider, it can be difficult to keep track of scholars' best understanding of which parts of the brain regulate what. What is clear in all of this is that emotions are situational appraisals that guide the reactions of physical creatures to the world around them. Just like our limbs and internal organs, emotions are integrated into our bodies Given external cues, emotions set off changes, mostly unconscious, in whatever body systems are relevant. Digestion, hearing, muscle tone, cognitive frames, sexual arousal, any of these and more can be called into action. Descartes' great error was that he thought mind and body were two separate entities. In fact, they are an interdependent whole a fully integrated system. What does all of this have to do with the God of the Bible, the God who becomes angry at evildoers and is pleased by the sweet smell of burnt offerings, the Jesus who loves the little children, all the children of the world? That is precisely what I hope you have been asking yourself. If I asked you whether God has a nose or a penis, what would you say? Most Christians would say probably not. A nose is for breathing and smelling. A penis is for sex and for peeing. A God has no need of either. In the same way, I would argue that God has no need for emotions. Emotions are intricate chemical reactions designed to activate and direct responses to the external environment. As wonderful as emotions are, they are made of and for the fabric of this natural world. <laughs>